I'm Michael Bentley, and uh, I am uh, pastor of Trinity CRC in St. Louis. I currently serve in the Abide Project Steering Committee and the media team, uh, and I have the honor of introducing our guest for this evening, Branson Parler. Uh, we're going to follow our regular model of having our guests speak for about 20 minutes and then answer questions uh, from the audience afterward. So as a reminder, please type in your questions into the chat pane uh, down below on Zoom. You can find a, a little chat icon and you can type to everyone. And uh, if you mark that as a question, we'll make sure to uh, pass that on to uh, Branson as we have time. Branson Parlor <laughs> has taught biblical interpretation, philosophy, worldview, church mission, human sexuality, and cultural engagement classes at the college and graduate level and currently serves as Professor of Theology and Director of Theological Education for the Foundry in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He is busy. He is a speaker and an author. Uh, he is Director of Faith Formation at Fourth Reformed Church in Grand Rapids, and he partners with his wife, Sarah, to homeschool their six children. Uh, we're glad that he's making a bit of a time uh, for us this evening. So the Abide Lecture Series welcomes Branson Parler. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm thankful to be part of this. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to connect with you and uh, grateful for the good work that uh, folks with the Abide Project are doing. Uh, and so really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to connect with you. Uh, so tonight, I, I want to uh, say just a couple things about my current context uh, and then spend a few minutes uh, talking about why I think this topic is, is so important. And um, uh, and, and thinking through some of the implications of this, uh, and then spend a few more minutes reflecting on what I've learned from uh, my experience within the RCA uh, and, and my context there. Uh, so Mike mentioned uh, that uh, in my current role, I'm working with uh, the Foundry, the Foundry Training Group uh, for 13 years from 2008 uh, until uh, 2021, I served at Kuiper College as a uh, professor of theology there. Uh, and just six months ago, myself and Jeff Fisher, who is in the CRC, uh, Nordane CRC mm -hmm. pastor, um, the two of us, uh, along with Sarah Beam, who's a longtime uh, registrar and served in multiple uh, administrative functions at Kuiper, the three of us uh, really felt God's leading to uh, step into something new that would work more directly with churches. Uh, in a lot of ways, see this as um, if, if, if this is a name or something that resonates with this group, I don't know, but... Um, I've always been struck by Reformed Bible Institute, RBI, going back 80 years as really focused on equipping the church uh, in this broad space between, between Sunday school and seminary, uh, and seeing this need to raise up and equip leaders uh, at every level within the church. And so uh, over the last few years, we just became increasingly convinced that a lot of uh, what we're involved in teaching and equipping around Bible, theology, cultural engagement— um, would be better served partnering directly with churches uh, rather than connected to a college environment that's increasingly um, not so affordable and not so accessible. Uh, and so we are working with a number of churches to, to think through how to pioneer uh, doing this in a way that's connected to regional hubs and churches who are interested in doing this kind of equipping uh, in, in a unique way. So that's what I've been up to the last six months or so, getting this launched. Uh, it's been a great opportunity, and uh, we're seeing, uh, as we connect with pastors and churches, a, a, a huge need in that way. And so uh, we would love, if, if that's something that you're interested in having more uh, conversation about, we would certainly love to, to connect with you, your church, uh, in that way. Well, I want to I want to talk for a couple of minutes about why I think this topic is so important. And um, I, I came to the Reformed tradition uh, from uh, the Baptist tradition. Uh, I grew up Baptist. Uh, my father was a, a Baptist pastor in Waterloo, Iowa. Both my grandfathers were Baptist pastors. And so I was sort of predestined to be a Baptist pastor as the oldest son. That's kind of how apostolic succession works in, in, in the Baptist tradition. Uh, but I came to, to Grand Rapids. Um, I came to Grand Rapids to go to Cornerstone uh, and in the process, uh, my, my second year uh, taking an intro to philosophy class, read uh, a little book uh, called Creation Regained by Al Walters. Uh, and two things really struck me uh, about the Reformed tradition. Uh, one was simply the importance of bodies. 
Uh, I grew up in, in a lot of ways, unbeknownst to me, a very, I don't want to say Gnostic, but kind of Gnostic leaning Baptist tradition that's it was all about the soul. It was all about the afterlife. It was all about making sure you'd, you'd prayed the prayer. And part of what struck me about the Reformed tradition was this focus on the importance of bodies, uh, of creation as good, uh, and as our bodies as part of God's good creation. Uh, so so that, was, that was one thing that struck me. The other thing that, again, really resonated with me was the way that the Reformed tradition, the, the Kuyperian tradition, looks at um, the big picture of worldview, that, that we try to look at um, the big picture, both of not only the, the gospel and the biblical narrative, but also to try to understand the worldviews that are, that are animating the culture around us. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, I see um, my work, especially on uh, human sexuality and theology of the body, uh, as, as rooted in these two really key themes uh, that for me, were, were central as uh, I grew in my own walk and journey, both my, my, in some ways my intellectual journey, but also my faith journey of understanding, uh, understanding my faith in a, in a deeper way. Uh, and so when I think about this, this topic in particular, one of the things that I think it's, it's really crucial for us to, to, to understand, to think about theologically, uh, is the way in which every body tells a story. Uh, Every body tells a story. That is that when we think about our bodies and when we think about questions of sex, marriage, and singleness, uh, that our bodies are taken up into some kind of larger narrative. Uh, and, and I think that's crucial uh, because it, it forces us to step back um, and ask the bigger question. But before we start thinking about ethical questions like, what should I do? We're at, we have to step back and ask the bigger question, what's going on here? How, how do I understand our culture as a whole? How do I understand what's unfolding in the church? Uh, and so I wanna, I wanna just briefly mention what I think are three myths that characterize our broader culture that, that shape this discussion around human sexuality. Uh, three myths that come from within the church uh, and then think through for just a minute, how I think the gospel reframes our approach to this, because one of the things I think that is so crucial as we approach this topic is, is that we have to understand how human sexuality, how, how bodies and sex and marriage and singleness are actually tied to the gospel and the gospel story. Um, because I'll admit, until I took a deep dive myself into these matters, um, I mean, again, growing up in the church, I kind of thought about this in terms of, of course, Jesus is good news for our eternal life, but a lot of times as the church, we're not actually able to articulate in a very winsome way how Jesus is also good news for our sex life, if I can say it that way. And, and so oftentimes we are, um, we're presenting a kind of a, a no rather than a yes, what we're against rather than what we're for. Uh, unable to articulate a, a clear, winsome vision for uh, for what the gospel is and how that's tied into to these matters. Um, and so, just very briefly, I think the the three myths from our from our broader culture. I think it's important to be aware of these because they're at play oftentimes, not only in um, you know those those people on the progressive side of things, more liberal side of things, but I often see them just as much in many of our more theologically conservative churches. Um, and, and the three myths are this. The first is the myth of individualism. Uh, this is the myth uh, that says you do you. Uh, you pursue what makes you happy. Um, anybody or anything outside of you that, that tries to define or tell you um, what to do or, or who you are is something to be overcome. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the first myth that we have to recognize is, and I would say is in many ways the foundational myth of our culture that, that's at play. And so we have to we have to get at that deeper story, not just uh, not just kind of the questions of sexual ethics, but realize that that's the deeper story that's often animating these things. Uh, the second myth is is really the myth of romance, uh, the myth that says uh, you complete me. Uh, where again, for each of us, in terms of what drives us individually, often is to find that that person who really recognizes us for who we are as a unique individual. Uh, and this is this is all this is all great. It's all good. You know, flashing back to Jerry Maguire, uh, you know, scenes of 
you complete me. And this is, again, part of our culture's narrative that this is the place where we find completion and, and fulfillment. Uh, and then the, the third myth is uh, the myth of naturalism or, or of materialism, that really our bodies are nothing more than matter in motion. Uh, and, and so because of that, you know, that, that myth combines very easily with the myth of individualism that says, you know, our bodies themselves don't actually have any meaning. Uh, and so it's up to us as individuals uh, to make something of ourselves, to make something of our bodies. Uh, they, they don't have any kind of inherent meaning uh, in and of themselves. And so I think, you know, when I think about the sexual ethics of our broader culture, it, it's really important that we help um, folks in our churches understand the way that those three myths are often driving how we think about sex and marriage and singleness uh, I think, again, whether you're in a more progressive or in a conservative church, that oftentimes you see those myths uh, come to the surface in a variety of ways. Uh, and so I think it's important that we, we're aware of those so that we can we can help um, not only speak against them and deconstruct them, but be aware maybe of even how they're shaping our own thinking in different ways. Um, now, those are kind of three secular myths, but I think there are three church myths as well that are that, that often drive us. Uh, and I think in, in some different ways, these are mirror images or correspond to the myths of our secular culture. Uh, and the, so the, the first myth I think that we often get in the church is uh, legalism, especially when it comes to these matters. So when we think about what drives us, the message is behave yourself, uh, right? Here are the rules, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Um, we articulate those very clearly. Again, those are the things that Rules are not necessarily a bad place to start, right? I have six kids, and so drawing those drawing those lines, uh, helping them understand what they should do and what they should not do, uh, is important. But that can't be the the totality of the story. And I think oftentimes with our sexual ethics, uh, we stop there. Uh, you know, again, over my 13 years teaching at Kuiper, getting kids from good conservative Christian churches come in, and we have these discussions. And and again, that's. Sort of the number one thing they say, what, what I've been taught is, thou shalt not, thou shalt. You know, know the rules, and it, kind of that's it. Uh, so I think we have to realize that that's, that's not enough and work against the myth of legalism. Um, and I think corresponding to the secular myth of romance, we also have our own kind of myth of sexual prosperity gospel, if I can say it that way, that, that flows, I think, from the legalism that says if, if, uh, if you follow the rules— uh, you are going to be blessed uh, with that spouse, with that perfect someone uh, who does complete you, who fulfills you. Uh, and again, this is where I think we have a not so biblical theology of singleness and marriage that that often sees singleness as this kind of proving ground or waiting time. And you know, if if you're good enough and if you meet the right person, uh, then that will lead you to to this sort of blessed life. Uh, and so it's it's. You know our version of your best life now. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's not the money that Joel Osteen promises, but certainly it's the good marriage, the family, the all those things kind of working in sync. Uh, and so I think that's a second church myth we have to be aware of. Uh, and then the the third myth is uh, the myth of evil bodies. This is the one that again that I grew up with in a lot of ways. That sometimes we communicate explicitly or implicitly uh, that our bodies themselves are the source of the problem. That our bodies themselves are the source of of sin. And so I think it's it's really important as we engage in these discussions. Um, I continually want us to, to to try to bring it back to the big picture, so that as we think about questions of sexual ethics, we don't end up focusing solely on questions of uh, ethics around same-sex marriage, same-sex relationship, uh, but to take the wide-angle lens so that we can see how a consistent biblical sexual ethic is connected to uh, the gospel narrative. Uh, and that's where I think the gospel serves as an antidote both to these secular myths and to these church myths, uh, again, in, in three different ways. Uh, I think in contrast to, to the individualism and legalism, the gospel focuses on the story of God's covenant faithfulness. That when we think about uh, what do individualism and legalism share, uh, they actually share this kind of focus on me. Uh, that it's about me, it's about what I do, what I accomplish. Whereas when we think about God's covenant faithfulness, we realize it, it starts with him, that instead of, you know, this vision of you do you, it's this, this biblical vision of you receive you, you know, you receive your identity from who you are uh, in Christ. And so 
we're thinking about framing it in terms of God's faithful covenant love uh, and how it is then that our vision, both of singleness and of marriage, are meant to embody and point to God's faithful covenant love. Um, in contrast to the stories of, of romance and sexual prosperity gospel, I think this is where when we think about the, the gospel story, we're actually focused on the work that Christ accomplishes for us, which includes the reality of suffering. Uh, I think the myth, both in the broader culture and in the church oftentimes, uh, is that you know, if you do the right thing, if you make the right decisions, it's going to lead you to this path uh, where you avoid suffering. Uh, now, I want to be clear here. I'm not don't want to in any way justify any kind of uh, suffering or abuse. I think the church often has overlooked uh, situations of abuse where we should have been more vocal. Uh, but I think we have to be clear here that when we think about uh, what covenant marriage looks like, uh, what singleness looks like as participation in the family of God, uh, that there is a taking up of our cross involved in that path, that it's it's not necessarily always an easy path. And so part of what I think distinguishes this is, is recognizing, you know, when it, when it comes to marriage, um, you know, what Stanley Hauerwas has said is that, you know, you always marry the wrong person. Uh, and so you realize that it's, it's a task, it's a calling uh, that we're called to as Christians. But I think as, as uh we think about a theology of singleness too, the suffering there, I think we often think of, you know, singleness means aloneness, means solitude. But what's interesting in scripture, when you look at the two most famous single people in scripture, Jesus and Paul, uh, their suffering was not the suffering of aloneness or solitude. It, it was a suffering actually that came from their commitment to the body of Christ, their connection to the body of Christ. And so very different, I think, from, again, very different cultures, but very different how we think about those things today. Uh, and then finally, I think part of what the gospel does is it reminds us that we're actually saved through the body of Jesus. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, there are numerous New Testament passages that speak about this, that uh, talk about how it's through the body of Christ, through the blood of Christ, that our salvation is actually accomplished. And so what you see is that scripture is profoundly material when it comes to how our salvation is accomplished. It's through the physical body of Jesus. Uh, and I think in a similar way, when you think about how 1 Corinthians 6, for example, talks about how our bodies are the temple, uh, you know, part of what you see there is that God's purpose is to dwell in his people so that through their life and holiness, they are a sign and pointer to God's character. Uh, that then when we think about what does it mean, wh why is it so important that we have a, uh, uh, an emphasis on holiness when it comes to singleness and marriage within, uh, within the Christian community? Uh, it's because these things, again, are meant to embody the gospel, meant to put God's faithful covenant love on display for the world around us. And so I think one of the key things for us to do as we continue to have these discussions and continue to engage um, around these matters is to make sure that we're, we're painting that broad picture uh, to help folks understand and see how the questions that we zero in on of sexual ethics are connected to the big story, both of the gospel and to our broader culture. So I think that's just a few thoughts in terms of why I think for me, this topic is, is so important. It's not just a standalone topic. Uh, it's not just a one question hot button topic, but when we think about this, it's, it's, it's really two different worldviews uh, that are being reflected in thinking through how we're gonna answer some of these, these specific questions. Um, so I want to talk for just a couple of minutes now about what I've learned from my experience in the RCA. As I said, I did not grow up in the RCA. I'm a group Baptist uh, and have been part of the RCA uh, for about 12, 13 years now. Uh, was ordained first as an elder at my church, Fourth Reformed Church here in Grand Rapids. Uh, and then in 2017 was ordained as a minister of, of Warden Sacrament. Um, and I, I've been involved in a number of ways in, in 2000. Uh, 14, I was elected to be the vice president of our regional synod, which I know, again, is an RCA aberration, uh, but I uh, served as vice president. Uh, it, it was a four-year term. They didn't give me all the details before they got me to agree to this, to be, to be up to this nomination. I don't know if you have that issue in the CRC where they're like, yeah, it's, it's a meeting. And they don't tell you about the meetings to prepare for the meetings and then the meetings after the meetings. And uh, so that was, it was an adventure. 
Uh, but I served then from uh, 2015 uh, through 2018 with our regional synod uh, and was involved there in uh, putting forward a number of things, uh, including the overture to general synod to clarify that the Heidelberg Catechism uh, does in fact speak to this matter, uh, which our general synod did in 2017. Uh, and then writing the Great Lakes Catechism on Marriage and Sexuality for the Regional Senate to use in a, in a variety of ways. Um, when I first started with the Regional Senate, uh, the, the regional pastor, the regional executive said to me at that time, it repeatedly said something that I have learned is very true. And he said, never underestimate the power of the status quo. Uh, and that has held true in a number of different ways that part of one, one of the great things about the reform tradition is uh, the variety of checks and balances uh, within our church polity. Uh, and that's a strength, but that can also mean sometimes that some things just never actually change and never actually happen. So maybe that's different in the CRC, uh, but I've seen in the RCA uh, the extent to which uh, that is true. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot about the mindset, both of folks who are more conservative and um, folks who are on the more liberal side of, of this discussion. And one of the ways, a few things that I think stand out to me about, especially at least in the RCA, folks who tend to be more on the liberal side of this is, uh, I would say conservative folks tend to see the world as the mission field. Uh, the more liberal folks tend to see the church as their mission field. And so they're trying to think about how do we change the church? The church needs to get up to speed with things. The church needs to change its stance. Uh, and so the focus really there is, uh, is on changing the church. Uh, I've also noticed, at least within the RCA, that more, uh, for whatever reason, folks who tend to be more liberal hold very tightly to their denominational identity. Uh, so even though their theology has often shifted, has often changed, uh, there is a sense in which they will not let go uh, of the denominational identity. You know, I, and I, that's where, again, as an outsider, somebody coming from a Baptist background, um, I would ask people and say, well, you know, this is really interesting. Why won't folks you know, in the RCA, why won't folks in New York and New Jersey just say, Man, we've had enough of this. Let's go with the United Church of Christ. I mean, they're, they, we wouldn't have to fight about this at all. They're already uh, have walked down this road. And that's where, you know, people just kind of laugh at me. Like, clearly, you're not, you know, you're not from these parts. Uh, you don't know how this works. These are, these are folks who've been part of this, who will trace their lineage back. They are not going to let go of the denominational identity. Uh, and so for a variety of reasons, at least in the RCA, it's conservative folks who've said, you know, we, we hold more tightly to the authority of scripture uh, than any denomination, than any name. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, that's, that's why you're seeing more of them at this point depart, depart the denomination. Um, and I've also seen that I think for folks from, um, of the more liberal mindset, that there, there's often this this uh, view that things are going to change, like people are going to come around. If, if we just talk about this enough, uh, if we just have enough dialogue, uh, then folks are going to shift their perspective and, and change their mind on that. And I think that's um, that's an interesting theological view. If you know church history, there are, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work. It would be nice if it worked that way. And if we just talked about it enough, everybody would agree on everything. Um, but 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 it doesn't. Um, a, a couple, a couple other things, and then I'll stop, and we can have some discussion. Because I'm, I, I want to go whatever direction, um, you know, seems good to the group where you have questions and thoughts. Um, I think drawing lines of clarity is hospitable and helpful in the long run. Uh, that oftentimes, um, I think we don't, we don't want to draw lines because we know that that means people are going to have to own their views and that there are consequences to that. Uh, but I think in the long run, it's, it's helpful. It's actually not hospitable to have a lack of clarity about where folks are, where people stand uh, on a variety of things. Uh, and so I think re related to that, dialogue, what I've seen in the RCA is that dialogue that's not aimed at decision is fruitless uh, and frustrating. Uh, and so I am, I I've, within the RCA, I was part of 
uh, you know, listening circles at the classes level, at the regional senate level, at the general senate level, at the classes level again, at the, yeah, it was like, let's just keep talking about this, but there was never a sense that the dialogue was aimed at coming to some kind of clear decision uh, and consensus. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think if and when you are encouraged in denominational settings to have dialogue, and I love dialogue, I think it's, I think it's crucial uh, to understand where people are at, why they think the way they do, to understand um, differing viewpoints, uh, but I think it has to be aimed at uh, some kind of action. Uh, otherwise, we just spend uh, a lot of time, a lot of time talking amongst ourselves. Uh, I would also say that, and and this is um, the last thing I'll say. A church, according to the Reformed Confessions, a church without discipline is not actually a church, uh, and that's because mission entails discipline. Right, that's true in every arena of life. Uh, a a military unit without discipline is not going to last as a military unit for very long. Uh, an an educational institution, a business, uh, right, family life in all of these areas, uh, if they have a mission, there has to be some kind of clear uh, discipline, discipleship. Uh, you know. It, that's going to guide how we function. Uh, and so what I've seen within the RCA is that even though the RCA in a variety of ways repeatedly affirmed that, you know, we hold to the historic biblical view, uh, people who were in positions of influence and authority and responsibility uh, often, often declined to use that authority and responsibility uh, to really to bring about discipline. And I know that sounds harsh, but it, if, if, if a denomination has a stance, but it's not willing to actually enforce it, then functionally, it doesn't actually have a stance. Uh, and that's, that's what, you know, went on for a couple of decades, several decades in the RCA to the point where uh, the RCA was no longer functional in that way, because it, because it lacked that, that discipline that comes from knowing who we are, uh, having clarity about that, and then knowing that people are going to be held responsible and accountable uh, to do that. Uh, so those are just a few insights from my time in the RCA, and I'd be glad to, uh, to field any questions or thoughts you have at this time. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. And um, first, I'm going to be selfish uh, because uh, we talked a little bit this morning. Um, I, now I'm really intrigued. Uh, what church were you a part of in Waterloo, Iowa? Yeah, so I, I grew up uh, at Burton Avenue Baptist Church, which was part of, I don't know if you're aware of Baptist circles at all, but it's part of the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. Uh, pretty good conservative kind of Northern Baptists. So that's, that, that's my lineage. Do you, do you know you know that denomination connection? Is I got I got saved in a Garbett church up in Mason City, Iowa, uh, oh, in high yeah. school, nice. and uh, Grace Baptist up there. And um, I learned how to do uh, house visits from my pastor at Ridgeway Baptist on the south end uh, there in Waterloo. So, uh, um, just really curious. That's interesting. Yeah, um, who, was your, who was your pastor at Mason City? Sorry, have to play. See, Dutch people get to play the Dutch connection, and now you got two <laughs> Baptist boys from Iowa. Yeah, um, Bill Burke was okay. my pastor up there. All right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, now real question. <laughs> so um, one of our real ones is, uh, is Branson staying with the RCA? And if so, why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um our church is in the process of uh, looking at all the options on this. Um, I, I can tell you pretty confidently that we are not going to stay in the RCA. Um, and so, so part of that is, uh, and again, I just laid this out with our adult Christian ed class um, this past Sunday, but it's important to understand, I think all the different, from my perspective, uh, over the last 20 to 25 years, the RCA has tried 
uh, every option available ba based on our church polity to try to clarify this, and every option has failed. Uh, that even though the General Synod, you know, we have General Synod statements on this, um, there's been a number of attempts to change the, the church, uh, the book of church order. Uh, and so part of what I've seen uh, within the RCA is that uh, churches who are more conservative leaning on this are often the churches that are more uh, vital and growing uh, within the RCA. Uh, and uh, there's just, I think, a level of frustration uh, with the fact that the status quo d does not and, and will not change uh, within the RCA. Uh, and so within you know, the, the numbers that I've seen recently, just since 20, since 2020, the churches that have departed just in the last couple of years or expressed intention to depart. Um, and again, these are the churches that are just out of the gate. You know, they're ready to go now. Uh, represents about 11% in terms of number of churches, uh, but represents around 25% in terms of total members uh, within the RCA. Uh, and so that's just, again, like I said, those are the people who are ready to go or who are already out the door. Uh, and so I think what I'm seeing, at least around the RCA, is that there's a variety of speed with which people are exiting, uh, but the, the majority of folks who are on the conservative uh, end of things are are making that move. And so I anticipate we'll be with them. Um, a follow up to that. Would you consider the CRC? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, this is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk amongst RCA folks about that. And really, I love the, the CRC. I kind of, I guess I ended up in the RCA by Providence as well, because when I moved into my neighborhood here in Northeast Grand Rapids, of course, there are numerous churches here and we kind of stuck, just visited the RCA church and that stuck. Um, so, so we're open to that. I think the, but I think most folks within the RCA are weary of fighting this battle. Uh, and so I think that is maybe one reason why, uh, I don't know whether that's encouraging or discouraging for, for you all to hear, but uh, I, I think people are, are saying, you know what, I mean, the lesson we've learned is that this really is a difference that makes a difference and people aren't changing their positions on it. And so if you think it's an essential, uh, if you think it's a topic that's essential, not, uh, not optional, then it really does create a division. And so part of the question is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a question of choose your hard, you know, which, which hard path are you going to take? So. So, um, my boy, and, and follow up to that, um, what would the CRC need to do for RCA churches to feel welcome in coming to the CRC? What is a resolution to our current situation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, there there are, from my perspective, there are some key things that are different about the CRC's context than the RCA's. Uh, you know, when I when I think about, you know, such a helpful, um, you know, the work that's being that's been done by the committee on human sexuality. Yeah, the the insistence was sticking with folks who actually hold to the CRC's position to put that together. Um, I have great appreciation uh, for uh, the professors at, at Calvin Seminary uh, and others because of the way that, that they have um, stayed true to this in a way that uh, within the RCA, you did not have that. You had, you know, the seminary, the folks at Western Seminary, um, the, the senior leadership within the RCA all were either vocally uh, on the other side uh, or kind of passively letting things unfold. And so I, th I do think within the CRC, uh, you have more going for you in terms of, in terms of those uh, folks who are in those positions. I think one of the key things is um, you, can't, you can't take a passive approach. You have to keep clarifying this 
and then it and then enforcing enforcing it where you need to as you, as you move forward so so to me that you know i i feel at home with say the professors at calvin seminary in a way that i mean 5 years ago when i was at general senate all the western professors were not happy with now they've had a lot of change over since then um, but there was just a great sense of animosity there okay um yeah there's a lot of questions coming in kind of related to this uh just a, a strategic kind of a question uh, how do how, how do how do we as seeing the need for discipline how do we carry out discipline uh, when those of the hierarchy of the denomination do not seem to even want to allow it yeah, and don't carry it out in their own churches. Right. Yeah, I think that's, um, boy, I, I wish I had the answer to that. I, I think if I were to say, if I were to look back in the RCA and say, well, what could the RCA have done, done better? Uh, I do think a kind of groundswell of people who were willing to, in the RCA, bring charges against people. Uh, and that did happen in some contexts, but that's where it also gets cumbersome because, right, who has time right, in the midst of pastoral ministry and life and everything else? Uh, I think that's where people kind of started to look around and say, you know, our time could be consumed with just thinking through some of these discipline cases. But I do think um, there were some missed opportunities there uh, that would have been helpful and clarifying had people been willing to act on them. But it's, it's. I know it's incredibly painful. Uh, it's it's time consuming. Uh, you're looked at as the bad guy. Uh, you know, so there's not a lot of things about it that are real appealing um, for people to step into that. But again, I think for me, that's one of the things that, in retrospect. Um, I think if the RCA had been better about that, there may have been uh, more of a chance. Okay. A um, little change here of questioning. Uh, do you think there is another gospel on the revisionist side? Um, if so, what are the aspects of it? And I guess kind of a, an idea behind that is you talk about uh, being redeemed to holiness in our bodies. Yeah. Um, and and I've, I've noticed, and I think other people have noticed from a, a, a revisionist standpoint, it seems like our bodies are fine. In fact, as they read the, uh, the book of creation, that's where they take their norms. We're fine from there. And so there, we're redeemed to having our urges fulfilled and affirmed. Is there really another gospel? How do we address that? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I do think, I mean, I think you're right to point out, I think before digging into the question of another gospel, it is this question of priority of how we think about special and general revelation. And, and I think there's a danger here of, of looking at those two as, as equal, uh, as opposed to special revelation being the lens through which we're going to test uh, you know, whatever we hear from science or psychology or, or, or whatever we, whatever we hear. Uh, I do think that, and I want to be careful here because it's, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but I think what I've seen is that oftentimes um, you do end up with an understanding of, of grace. I don't know about the, uh, I suppose the gospel, because it is a question of grace. Um, that is not sufficiently biblical. That you know, when you understand the work of uh, grace and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, again, this is where you, know, you read the Heidelberg Catechism, the Confession, uh, the Belgian Confession, continually point to these things in Scripture, in terms of mortifying the flesh, crucifying the flesh, and uh, and and its desires. I think there's often a view of grace uh, that that focuses on forgiving grace. Uh, but doesn't uh, focus on empowering grace and how God's grace transforms us so that we are able to live a life that, you know, that on our own strength, we, we can't live, uh, that, that everyone, uh, you know, gay, straight, or otherwise, uh, is inclined to uh, live in a way that's not compatible with the gospel. Uh, and so all of us need 
that transforming power at, at work in us. And so I think uh, it can it can be a kind of cheap grace uh, that I, that that sometimes comes through in that. Now again, this is where I think we have to be clear, make sure make sure that we're not preaching cheap grace to you know the good straight sinners sitting in our pews as well. That's kind of like, well, that's just, uh, you know, of, of course, 46% of men looked at pornography in the last week. That's just that, you know, that's normal that, you know, that's, so I think that's where you have to be careful that uh, I think those kinds of accusations sometimes of, of uh, overlooking some sins for others can sometimes hold merit. But, but now let me say this. I hear conservative folks call out sin a lot more than, yeah, I was at a regional Senate meeting once where they were like, well, you know, who's, you know, well, why are we calling out, uh, you know, people in same sex relationships? Would you do that if, you know, two straight people were just living together or something else? And, you know, several pastors were like, yes, in fact, we do. Like that's, you know, and this person said it like, you know, nobody does that, of course. And a good number of people are like, uh, that is what we do. And so I, I, I think that's... <laughs> You know, that's where I see people who are still willing to to exercise that kind of discipline. Um, they're not inconsistent. They are being consistent across the board, teaching that to folks and and holding that up. Interesting, interesting. So um, I I really like that idea of do we need uh, a message of empowering grace? Um, is is that uh, a, a better tack to take. I know we've debated that within um, conversations um, in Abide. Uh, you know, if you take the classic uh, idea of the good and the beautiful and the true, um, yeah. it seems like the battle for inside the church for the next 10 years is not just seeing God word, God's word as true, but also as beautiful. And yeah. as if that is that, an, is that going to be enough though? Well, yeah, that's that's a good question. I think yes and no. I, I think it is. I think it's our task to articulate this in as winsome as way as possible, and, and that's I think where we do have a lot to, a lot of work to do. Because I mentioned, you know, more youth group sermons about no. Uh, that's not very winsome, uh, right? It's, it's not a very compelling, beautiful vision uh, of of what singleness and, and marriage are all about. Um, I think. Actually, in my experience, um, you know, probably John Paul II does the best job of articulating a theology of the body that's winsome and beautiful. Um, and that might, you know, different people might have different uh, suspicions about reading the Pope on this. Uh, but but this is where I was prepared for that by reading Kuiper and the goodness of the body. I'm like, the body is good. Uh, you know, points to the reality of who God is. And then I read John Paul II and his theology of the body. I was like, I have never read a reformed author talk in this depth and this length about the beauty of both marriage and singleness within the context of, of the gospel. Um, so that's a, I mean, that, that, that's a route to go if, if, if you're interested in digging more into that. Christopher West's book, Our Bodies Tell God's Story, uh, is is kind of a brief summary and introduction introduction to that, but but I think we have to recognize that even if we uh, are you know tell this in the most beautiful, compelling, winsome way, we're telling it within a cultural context where it is inevitably going to be uh, not perceived and not heard as beautiful and compelling and winsome, right? That's where I think, like I said, the individualism of our culture. Uh, has set us up so that if anybody outside of myself tells me this is who you are, this is what you ought to do, uh, that's ugly, right, to, through the lens of our culture. Um, but I think it is our job to, right, I think about this almost like a, you know, like an art historian, somebody who's going to help you understand paintings that, you know, I, I'm not a great I'm not a huge art person, but when I listen to somebody who does know it, I'm like, okay, I can see and understand even paintings that I might not initially see as beautiful. I can come to understand better the logic and the beauty behind them. Uh, and so it's our duty, I think, to paint as beautiful a picture as possible while recognizing that our culture might stand there and look at it and say, 
that's horrible, <laughs> right? That, that's ugly. But trusting that God is going to work uh, so that at least some who hear that are going to be drawn to it, that, that it is this counterintuitive message uh, that is going to spark at least some kind of interest. Right? Because I think in our culture, that's part of where we're at. You know, part of what it means to be in a secular culture is you know, we're living alongside people who are going to look at us and say that's weird. They're also going to say at some point, they might say, is there, some, is there something to that? Like w- when I see two people living in this faithful Christian marriage for 50 years, growing in sanctification, loving each other, maybe there's something to that as opposed to like just uh, go with what makes you happy for now right? And then swap people out. And so I think part of our task is to trouble people a little bit, even if they don't fully understand it. Uh, just a couple more here, and, and maybe we'll, we'll get into this one, because I think it's, it's probably pretty deep, um, but it hits on a couple of things that we've, we've talked about um, in addressing uh, a, a revisionist side uh, and also in light of what you just talked about, uh, an individualist culture and, and resisting anyone uh, pressing our autonomy to define our own identities. Um, going to Romans one, um, the idea of uh, the idea of, of homosexual acts being contrary to nature, chapter one, verse twenty six. There, Romans one twenty six. Um, yeah. Our in the way that revisionists read the book of creation, are are they reading it wrong? Are we reading it wrong? Are they putting it? Are they putting creation above scripture? Um, and and how would we how would we then put show them how to put scripture above? To as you said, you know, are we interpreting nature according to scripture? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when when I think about how Romans 1 uh, sets things up, I think there's, at least as I read it, I think there's this clear sense in which, again, Paul is um, pointing to creation and pointing to the way that, uh, again, that Gentiles, uh, apart from God's revelation, uh, what they what they do with that book of creation, so to speak, uh, and the way that that's the way that that's skewed. And so I think that um, that when you think about what is what's going on there, I think that actually in the uh, I think the revisionist reading of Romans one is committing in some ways the same mistake as Paul is saying that the Gentiles are, which is that it's it's misreading creation. Uh, and that that part of what Romans one is is trying to help us do is to see, what happens when we misread creation, not just intellectually, but what happens in terms of idolatry and sexual immorality uh, and, and how you see that as a persistent, you know, persistent problem in, in human culture and history. Uh, and so I think that, that in, terms of, uh, in terms of what Romans 1 does is it points us back to say uh, we, need, we need special revelation to even help us understand to frame our doctrine of creation and our doctrine of general revelation, uh, that that in in that way, I would say uh, part part of what's so interesting about the revisionist reading is I think that it maybe this is my own bias, but it kind of obviously misses uh, some of the key creational points that that Paul is making uh, in in Romans one. It, but say more about that if there are follow up or, or further thoughts, things you want to dig into with that. There are all sorts of stuff that that I would love to get into this because it seems like um, we the Bible does place uh, our reading of people uh, in, in a, a very outside, a very fleshy context. Uh, you look at the Old Testament and prohibitions on men wearing women's clothing. Now that can be seen as a, uh, obviously a, a, a transgender-ish uh, issue, uh, but obviously relating to uh, uh, the holiness and the separation that goes on with other things within the Old Testament. Um, so I guess uh, it, it's, it seems that uh, 
the confusion comes when people want to say, well, inside is where the truth is. The outside means nothing. Yeah. And it's, yeah. but, but yet the way scripture seems to say is that there is a truth on the outside that yeah. we do follow. And that in many ways takes precedence over what we are led to feel. Yeah. Which runs right into our, our problems with our, our society today. Yeah. And, and that's where I think to me, part, part of what strikes me is that the, the, the biblical, the historic view here uh, takes bodies actually way more seriously uh, in, in terms of uh, what they tell us about who we are uh, as as male and female, uh, and what that implies for what that implies for sexual ethics, uh, I think this is where again it, it ties back into the individualism, but also the naturalism. I, I mean, we have to recognize that modernity, mo modern philosophy, modernity, the culture of modernity as a whole hates bodies, and, and I think. Oftentimes we hear differently, you know, that our culture loves bodies and, you know, it's Christians who are body haters, body shamers, uh, et cetera. But, but really it's, it's modernity that says, I mean, in some ways your body is something that limits you and therefore defines you that, you know, my mind doesn't in many ways control my body, that my body tells me something about who I am. It's, it's not just plastic, uh, but yet part of what you see um, in modern science and, and elsewhere is really this drive to completely um, have complete uh, ability over our bodies to to change them, to alter them, to do whatever we will with them. That that really is just as much of a kind of dualism as you'll find in Plato or or anything else in terms of having a pretty hard view of uh, the mind's rule over over the body. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a lot to think about and analyze. Um, let me let me take you in a slightly different directions here, uh, because we're looking at right now uh, the Human Sexuality Report in the CRC understood to be having because it references biblical uh, chastity and sexuality. It's already a confessional matter. Um, do the confessions have to explicitly prohibit same sex? sexual activity in order to be confessional from an RCA minister here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it, it, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would say uh, that my, my understanding of the Heidelberg catechism is that it, it should be taken uh, as the report says. Uh, and, and in fact, that's part of what motivated me to think along these lines, was it at General Senate 2016 when I went there, I repeatedly heard people from the RCA say, like, our creeds and confessions don't address this. Our creeds and confessions don't address this. Uh, and I was sitting there thinking, well, I mean, the Heidelberg Catechism definitely addresses matters of, uh, of, of sex. I mean, because it's the, the Ten Commandments. And so I think, I, I do think that the logic that they spell out is correct. And I think uh, actually one uh, one added layer to that. Let me grab my let me grab my Bible to make sure I'm giving you the right verses. Uh, one added layer that I think the the report doesn't give, uh, and that actually I, I came across later. My friend uh, Preston Sprinkle, his book "People to Be Loved." Um, so this is just a this is maybe a point of biblical minutia, but I think it I think it's actually relevant to this because. Um, part of what the catechism is getting at is, again, this idea that um, all sexual immorality uh, is prohibited, not just, obviously not just adultery, but this is a way of speaking of all sexual immorality. When you think biblically then about what that is, uh, that includes repeatedly uh, same-sex sexual activity, starting from uh, not only the normative uh, nature of Genesis 1 and 2, but the Levitical Code of Leviticus 18, that gets reinforced in the New Testament when um, Jesus and others speak about sexual immorality. Uh, when Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council uh, upholds that, all of those things point to, um, again, not just same-sex sexual activity, but including same-sex sexual activity as something that's prohibited there. 
And so the, the other piece of this is that um, a lot of scholars think that in 1 Timothy 1, uh, Paul is there summarizing the law uh, in different ways. And part of his summary there does include, uh, you know, he mentions uh, sexual immorality and uh, same-sex sexual activity in, in that context. Uh, and so that's just a point that I think if 1 Timothy 1 is sort of Paul's summary of Exodus 20, uh, I think that just lends further support to uh, the fact that I, I would say, again, that all sexual immorality is held up as a confessional matter because of how it appears and in, in how it's addressed in the Heidelberg Catechism. And that I would say that that would include other matters that that the uh, uh, that the report talks about. You know that if that if somebody was to start teaching, uh, you know, like Nadia Bowles Weber, the the Lutheran pastor from Colorado, who's who talked about has referenced ethically sourced pornography, right? Then you would say that you're violating the confessional standards. Uh, like that is like that, and and so that's why I think it. I do think it's really important um, to address the broad scope in the in the way that the the report does. What I appreciate about it is um, talking about things like pornography, talking about things like polyamory. Uh, this is not singling out um, same sex marriage uh, as just a standalone issue, but it is a way of of thinking about these things much more broadly. Uh, and and I think that's really helpful because a lot of those other things that maybe now are not front and center uh, are going to be front and center, right? Things like polyamory, uh, et cetera. There's already Christians who are advocating uh, for that, for blessing polyamorous relationships, you know, three or more people in romantic sexual relationships. Uh, and so I think, so I think that, one of the things I would emphasize in in saying all this again is that when you talk about the Greek word porneia or sexual immorality, you talk about all these things together. One of the interesting things is that the Bible does put all those things together so often that it does not single out and say, by the way, uh, people who are involved in same-sex relationships are particularly worse than all these other sins. That most of the time when the New Testament talks about this, it's all together, right? Sexual sin is sexual sin. Uh, that's a good roundup. Um, wondering, um, do you have? You've mentioned uh, just a couple of uh, a couple of books here, and um, certainly uh, uh, the book by uh, Preston Sprinkle there, and your work with the Center on Faith and Sexuality. Is that what is the the name of that organization? Yeah, yeah, the Center for Faith, uh, Gender, and Sexuality. Faith, gender, and sexuality. Thank you. Or it um, might it yeah. might be sexuality and gender. I always I'm not quite sure which order those come in. I'm familiar with some of that. And you've mentioned, obviously, uh, Pope John Paul II. Uh, that's, you know, pretty wide range there. Do you have any other books you'd like to recommend that we uh, that we read? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, yeah, Preston's book, People to Be Loved, is, is helpful. Um, his new book, Embodied, uh, if, if uh, you're interested in the discussion around transgender identities, um, and it, it kind of depends. Again, there's a wide variety of books in terms of theological and pastoral care. Uh, I think Mark Yarhouse's book on emerging gender identities uh, is helpful, as a, especially as a pastoral resource, uh, thinking about walking with kids and families through uh, questions around, around gender identity. And I, I, I do think it's really important that we recognize that these are theological and pastoral concerns. Um, and and so that book by Yarhouse, I think, is is really helpful. Um, I like uh, Ed Shaw's book, uh, Same Sex Attraction in the Church. Uh, it's from a probably about five or six years ago. But what I really like about that book is that, you know, he he talks about I think um, eight or nine different mis like theological missteps that set us up not only to um, not only to uh, be in, uh, I think, a bad spot in terms of thinking through same-sex relationships, uh, but it, it's a way of thinking about how the church as a whole, even many good conservative churches, have maybe bought into some of these missteps that that make uh, affirming same-sex relationships seem like the only plausible option. 
Uh, and so I've, I found that book uh, to be really helpful in, in thinking through maybe some of, the own, some of our own uh, assumptions and missteps when it comes to that. Um, just a kind of a, maybe a counter thing here. And, um, uh, one of the last questions I, I've gotten in here, um, uh, you, you're mentioning the, you're mentioning some books here and even, uh, you know, I'm listening to Preston's podcast, um, theology in the raw, you do get a lot of, uh, a, a wide variety of people interacting outside of the church with the church and, and even, um, accusing Preston of, you know, a bait and switch kind of theology. Yeah. Um, you know, just because he will eventually come down to say, you can't erase scripture. You can't say that it doesn't say what it says. And he's yeah. very, um, you know, he's very good at even saying, you know, progressive theologians who want the church to do things will openly admit, yeah, you can't, you can't say that it doesn't say these things about our sexuality. It just does. Um, is, is the winsomeness that we want to have, um, just a, uh, a marketing technique at some point in the eyes of someone, uh, on the, on the other side, a revisionist, Will they, are, are they, will they just not see it? Or is there a way to, to actually do this in a way that's not just, uh, you know, a customer set?